Let there be light. My name is John Getty. I am the director and co-author of tonight's entertainment. Welcome to Erie Evenings. The members of the Goose Creek Players welcome you, and we hope that you will consider returning to come to see our other shows. They'll be performing A Christmas Story in December, and then Sense and Sensibility in the New Year. I have been told to ask you that should the pressure in your body, in the fears, <laughs> overwhelm you, <laughs> that there are restrooms available on this wall <laughs> and out to the front. Oh, I'm supposed to be having uh, assistance. Ava! <coughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Erie Evenings. We hope you enjoy it. Come on, it's over here. So this is it, huh? First an old dirt road, and now a crawling stone house in the middle of the woods. Very nice. You sure know how to impress a girl. No, well, it's not supposed to be nice. It's supposed to be... Scary! <laughs> They're coming to get you, Linda. Peter, quit it. Now why would you want to scare me? Well, I thought maybe. Just maybe. If you got a little scared, a little spooked, you might <clears throat> just let me... Just for reassurance, of course. I mean... It is awfully cold out here, and, well, I mean, we are all alone. You're too much. Well, we sure do seem to be all alone. As I was walking up the stair, I met a man who wasn't there. He wasn't there again today. Oh, how I'd wish he'd go away. But when I got back home last night at 3, he was on the stair waiting for me. But when I looked around the hall, I couldn't see him there at all. Go away! Go away! And don't you come back anymore! Go away! Go away! And please don't slam the door! Last night, I saw upon the stair a little man who wasn't there. He wasn't there again today. Oh, how I'd wish he'd go away! Antagonist, William Hughes Mears. Peter, did you hear something? Hmm? Hear what? I thought I heard... Oh, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> oh, I knew you'd get spooked. This spot never fails. Oh. Um, I mean, we can go back if you want to. Write a movie or something? Not even a scary one. Uh, a romantic comedy. Just for you. I'm going to ignore the sexist undertones there. If you're not scared, then I'm not scared. You don't even know scary stories compared to me. How dare you? You know, I'll have you know, I have every Halloween movie memorized by heart. Why don't you go prank call a babysitter or something? It's not even Halloween. You want to scare me? You gotta go with the classics. Uh, like what? Uh, oh, Freddy Krueger? <laughs> no, how about Dracula? Fiend of the Night and Master of the Undead? Granddaddy of all monsters. <laughs> yeah, right. I want to suck your blood. Blah! <laughs> Go back to your day job. You want to hear something really scary? Listen to this. But remember, the female vampires are always a bit more dangerous. Mm -hmm. In the late 19th century, Britain began to stretch its fingers around the world, becoming less of a sleepy island and more of an economic powerhouse. However, as it developed these opportunities, it made the mistake of letting a monster into its midst. A monster that had laid in wait in the old lands of Eastern Europe. The first victim on English soil was the young maiden, Lucy Westenra. Now, her friends come
to say their last goodbyes, not knowing that the monster had taken her soul along with her life. From Minna Harper's journal, after her strange and unexpected sickness, Lucy's service was very simple and very solemn. Jonathan and I stood hand in hand, and we felt that our best and dearest friend was gone from us. Looking at her, it was as if death had given her back her beauty. Her brows and cheeks were full, and even her lips had lost their deathly pallor. She's still so radiant. Can my sweet Lucy really be dead? Poor Arthur, to have lost such sweetness out of his life. But there she is, dressed in the wedding gown that she didn't live long enough to wear. Having failed to arrest her strange ailment, Dr. Van Helsing kept a respectful distance, eyeing the crowd and searching the faces for what I couldn't tell. After the funeral, we left, shocked that our blessed lives had been shaken so suddenly. In the Westminster Gazette, 28 October. Over the last several days, several children have been reported missing or not returning from the heath. Although too young to adequately explain themselves, they each described a beautiful lady dressed in white. Not again! Not so soon! From the Westminster Gazette, 28 October. All the children who disappeared were discovered with a small wound or tear in the throat. Police believe these wounds were caused by a rat or small dog. And the fact being, that all the children had similar wounds to be coincidental. Even so, police advise parents to watch to straying children. <laughs> you must meet with me at Lucy's crypt. The forgetfulness, the terrible lethargy, the, the wounds to the throat. The children's symptoms are too similar to be coincidence. We must Join me at Lucy's script, uh, uh, her song, and, uh, and the very lives of these children are at stake. Why are we here? What are you going to do? <sighs> to open the coffin? <gasps> you shall yet be convinced. <gasps> it's empty! Where is she? Perhaps the body satcher? Did you take her? Lucy Weston now rose from her grave of her own volition. There was no illness that killed her. The blood was drained from her by one of the undead. And that turned her into one of the undead as well. Are you mad? Ah, would that I were. <laughs> Madness would be much easier to bear. Oh. 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 Come along, little dear one. I promised you a sweetie to make you smile. Now come along. Just a little further. And I'll kiss your neck and make it all better. You're holding me too tight. My neck, it hurts. Hold still, pet. One more kiss, and all the pain will go away. Lucy, is that really you? Arthur, my love. <sighs> we need good to care. Arthur, leave these others and come to me. 
My arms are hungry for you. Come, and we can rest together. Come, my husband. No, Come. this is not she. This thing has lost its features, but uh, 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 the sweetness that was there is all hardness and cruelty and her, 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 her purity is rottenness and she desires only blood. Mina, oh Mina, my one true friend. These men, they've turned on me. Do you hear the lies they tell about me? They want to hurt me. Make them stop, Mina, make them stop. You're not Lucy! Turn this child to her family. And then? <sighs> Two nights hence, we shall meet again. We have yet one terrible task before us. We have freed Lucy's soul and ensured the safety of the village. But we still need to face the monster that did this to her and turned her into this thing. Dracula still eludes us. After, uh, after Lucy, it just doesn't really, I don't know, seem all that scary. Uh, what about zombies? Oh, God, no. Overdone. Um, <laughs> yeah, give, me, give me a minute to think. You do another one. Uh, let's see. Ooh, I've got another classic for you. Uh, a monster resurrected by science that goes on a rampage throughout Europe. Why do I feel like the answer is communism? <laughs> no, Frankenstein, and not the. 
<laughs> monster, but the original, an eloquent and cunning fiend who sought vengeance on his creator. Dead flesh. That's what's laid on the examination table of Dr. Victor Frankenstein's laboratory. Frankenstein was not content with existing knowledge, and in his hubris, demanded to know the secrets of life and death. What emerged from the table was a perversion of science. He imparted the spark of life into this mound of flesh. And the <coughs> horrific thing he brought into this world was both hideous and filled with hatred for its creator. Frankenstein's monster began destroying all those cro close to its creator. Finally, hunting down Victor and his young bride. What is it that I have to teach you, my dear Victor? You seem so wild. What is it that you fear? All will be safe. But the night is dreadful. So very dreadful. Victor, what is it? You're frightening me. There is a man. He is hideous to behold and full of hate and loathing for everything that lives. He's sure to come for me. But do not be afraid. You know that I would die to protect you. But Victor, why? Who is this man? What does he... I'll tell you everything, but later. Once this creature is destroyed, we'll have a lifetime together. Wait until daybreak, and there'll be a lifetime of sunshine and laughter and natural children that we'll make together. Then the day cannot come soon enough, my love. My lord, everything is secured. Wait here. Guards are posted outside but I want to make sure all the windows and doors are barred. Once this monster comes, I'll be ready for him. Not a sound. If you call to him, I'll make you watch as I kill him. Who are you? I am revenge made flesh. Newly born and abandoned. I don't understand. What happened to your face? Am I not beautiful? I am as your handsome husband crafted me, like a sculptor with his clay. But let's ask him why he was not more skillful. Victor? Yes. Victor. He thought creating life would make him a god. He made me a hideous thing that no one would ever look upon with affection. Even he screamed when he saw my face. He ran leaving me confused, hated, and alone to learn of the world. A year ago last night, I asked him to make me a female of my kind so that I could retreat from the world with the love of one other being. He refused. So I killed Henry Clerval, his brother William, and Justine, and many others. And I will kill everyone he loves. Come, embrace death. <laughs> if I am to never know love, then neither will he. The house is sealed. We're safe for now. 
Hello, Father. Never call me that, you devil. Oh, all men hate the wretched. How much more so must I be hated, who are miserable beyond all living things? Elizabeth? Elizabeth! Dr. Frankenstein, you yourself are responsible for that cold, dead flesh created in this hideous form a blight upon God and man. You made me, and are therefore responsible for every death that I do. Shall we end this now? Fashion me a companion, and I'll leave you to eke out what small happiness you have in the rest of your years. I will not create a race of devils on earth. <laughs> So just the one, huh? Is that your idea of goodness, then? The tortures of hell are too mild a vengeance for thy crimes. You propose to kill me. How dare you? How dare you make a sport in life again? You made me! I ought to have been your Adam! But instead, I am a fallen angel. Your creation is my sin, and I alone should have paid for it. I'll die if it means purging you from this world. My reign of terror over you is not yet over! Follow me to the everlasting ices of the north. You will feel the misery of the cold and frost, but I am immune. Come on, my enemy. I will devote my life to sending you to death. We will wrestle for our lives, but many hard and miserable hours must you endure until that blessed event arrives? Bury your pretty little wife and then follow. We are bound by ties that can only be broken by the annihilation of one of us. On that, we are agreed. She really made it pop. Horror just needs a woman's touch. <laughs> really? Are, are we going to get woke with ghost stories now? <laughs> Always. Particularly if you want to put your arms around me again. <laughs> I yield. Uh, now I guess I'm just more unnerved about the idea of a man returning from the grave to seek revenge. All this horror talk is really starting to get to you, huh? Well, I mean, I guess it's... I guess it's more the power of revenge, and I mean, when it comes in the form of a monster seeking it from beyond the grave, I mean, yeah, yeah, that's scary stuff. They hang John Farrell at the dawn amid the marketplace. At dusk came Adam Brand to him and spat upon his face. Ho, neighbors all, spake Adam Brand, see ye John Farrell's fate. Tis proven here a hempenus is stronger than man's hate. For heard ye not John Farrell's vow to be avenged upon me from life or death? See how he hangs high in the gallows tree. Yet never a word the people spoke with fear and wild surprise. 
the grisly corpse raised up its head and stared with sightless eyes, and with strange motions, slow and stiff, pointed at Adam Brandt, and clambered down the gibbet tree, the noose within its hand. With gaping mouth stood Adam Brandt, like a statue carved of stone, till the dead man laid a clammy hand, hard on his shoulder bone. Then Adam shrieked like a soul in hell, the red blood left his face, and he reeled away in a drunken run, the screaming marketplace. And close behind the dead man came with a face like a mummy's mask. And the dead joints creaked and the stiff legs cracked with their unwanted task. Men fled before the flying twain, or shrank with bated breath. And they saw in the face of Adam Brand the seal set there by death. He reeled on buckling legs that failed, yet on and on he fled. And so, through the shuddering marketplace, the dying fled the dead. At the river's side fell Adam Brandt, with a scream that rent the skies. Across him fell John Farrell's corpse, nor ever the twain did rise. There was no wound on Adam Brandt, but his brow was cold and damp, for the fear of death had blown out his life, as a witch blows out a lamp. Oh, his lips were writhed in a horrid grin, like a fiend's on Satan's coals. And the men that looked on his face that day, his stare still haunts their souls. But such was the fate of Adam Brand, a strange, unearthly fate. For stronger than death, or have the noose, are the fires of a dead man's hate. From A Dead Man's Hate, a poem by Robert E. Howard. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I, I guess my mind was wandering. Uh, say, you, you do think we're alone, don't you? I feel like someone's been watching us. See, now you're spooking yourself out. <laughs> you really think that I'm scared? I do. Okay. All right, my love, sit back. I grant you Bram Stoker and oh, Mary Shelley, but let me regale onto you a classic tale of horror. <clears throat> Real horror. <laughs> by Mr. H. P. Lovecraft. Ooh, I just got chills. Mm -hmm. You know, kept the rats at bay. Used to. Used to. I, I, I received your letter and, and I wanted to thank you for inviting me to meet you here. I, I found your letter rather um, intriguing. And you don't believe me. <coughs> Mr. De La Poor, if my reputation precedes me at all, you will know that this is my line of work. I will not simply dismiss your claims out of hand. In fact, I would... The facts are indiscernible. My letters, a parable, a metaphor at best. How could I put into words indescribable horror? I know what I saw, but my own eyes can't make sense of what it was. And now, I have to relate this to you somehow. Impossible. Impossible! I still don't know what those 
those things are, or why they fired me here. Mr. Delacroix, do you mean to tell me that they, that is those things, the, uh, the, uh... The rats in the walls. They followed me. I don't know what they want. Damn, it's chilly in here. Where did that breeze come from? Did you hear that? No. No, no, I don't think so. It faded for a while. The noise? Yes, the noise. Of course, the noise! I'm sorry. Forgive me? It's been a trying few months, as I'm sure you can imagine. Yes. Yes, I'm sure. Your letter was very thorough. I was rather distressed simply reading it. Oh, I can't imagine what it must have been like to actually experience it all. I don't remember any of it, you know. Not after we got down there. Nothing. And now, here I am. Here. Hungry! And all I have with me are the stories that others have told me. And the noise. down those horrible stairs. The architecture, the smoothness of the stone stairs. Something made it so that even when you, when you looked right at them, the angles made no sense. Oh, I'm making no sense. The noise, it was all I could think about. What was he looking for? Who? No! No, he was calling. Why couldn't the others? Why couldn't they have... Yes? Why couldn't they... Oh! Oh, the sound! Oh! Oh! Do you remember them? Oh. Uh. Nyarla the Temp! The Crawling Chaos! Nyarla the Temp! How do you know that name? And where Nyarla the Temp went? Rest vanished. For the small hours were rent with the screams of nightmare! Oh! The noise! The noise has followed me! No! Ah! Could you be more precise about the nature of the sound? 
sound like? What? Well, what did it sound like? Oh, what did it sound like? Uh, thousands of tiny squeaks and rustlings that rose and fell like waves, like the, like the wind, like, like. How to gust? Would you swing me go twice? Activator. Activator! Activator! Addis. Dia add. Add. A gas. Add. A Dane. A gas. Bass. Dinos. shall be satisfied. The son of Azelthoth will devour all. The final summoning will not be prevented. He has seen me, and I have seen him. Damas, Dolas, Ort, Aghast! Pizza! Uncle, uncle! Ch 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 Dolas! What? Agus! Pizza! Dolas! Ort! of these things trying to crawl out of their way out to our world, hiding in the shadows, but gaining strength. I don't know that I like that. And, and rats? Why does it have to be rats? Like those? <laughs> <laughs> oh, ha ha. I admit it, you got me. Yeah, I did. <laughs> what well, makes you feel any better? I, uh, well, I kind of freaked myself out, too. Can you get a hug? Just to make me feel better? How about a snack instead? Um, let's go get the picnic basket from the car. I like the way you think. All right, uh, I'll meet you back here in 15 minutes. Oh. <laughs> okay. uh, I changed my mind. You're coming with me, but then we're coming right back here. I've got another story for you, and this one will scare your socks off. So you are trying to undress me? <laughs> <laughs>
Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered, weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore. While I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. Tis some visitor, I muttered, tapping at my chamber door, only this and nothing more. Ah, distinctly I remember. It was in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I, I wished the morrow. Vainly I had sought to borrow from my books surcease of sorrow. Sorrow for the lost Lenore, for the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels named Lenore. Nameless here forevermore. And the silken, sad, and certain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before, so that now to, to still the beating of my heart I, I stood repeating to some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. This it is, and nothing more. Presently my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. Sir, said I, or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore. But the fact is, I was napping, and so gently you came rapping, and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door, that I scarce was sure I heard you. Here I opened wide the door. Darkness there, and nothing more. Deep into that darkness peering, Long I stood there wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, and the stillness gave no token, and the only word there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore. This I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word, Lenore. Merely, Merely this. this. And nothing, nothing more. more. Back into the chamber turning, all my soul within me burning. Soon again I heard a tapping, somewhat louder than before. Surely, said I, surely that is something at my window lattice. Let me see then what thereat is, and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment, and this mystery explore. Tis the wind, and nothing more. Open here I flung the shutter, when with many a flirt and flutter, in there stepped a stately raven. raven. Of the saintly days of yore, not the least obeisance made he, not a minute stopped or stayed he, but with mien of lord or lady, perched above my chamber door, perched upon a bust of palace, just above my chamber door, perched and sat, and nothing more. Then this ebony <coughs> bird, beguiling my sad fancy into smiling, by the grave and stern decorum of the continents it wore. Though thy crest be shorn and shaven, thou, I said, art sure no craven. Ghastly, grim, and ancient raven, wandering from the nightly shore, Tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's plutonium shore. Quoth, Quoth the, the raven, raven nevermore. nevermore. Much I marvel this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly, though his, its answer in little meaning, little relevancy bore. For we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door. Bird or beast upon the sculptured bust above his chamber door with such name as nevermore. But the raven, sitting lonely on that placid bust, spoke only that one word, as if his soul in that one word he did outpour. Nothing farther than he uttered, not a feather than he fluttered, till I scarcely more than muttered. Other friends have flown before. On the morrow he will leave me as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, 
nevermore. Startled at the stillness broken, by reply so aptly spoken, doubtless, said I, what it utters is its only stock and store, caught from some unhappy master, whom unmerciful disaster, followed fast and followed faster, till his songs one burden bore, till the dirges of his hope that melancholy burden bore. Um, never, never, never more. But the raven, still beguiling all my fancy and the smiling, straight I wheeled a cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door. Then upon the velvet sinking, I betook myself to linking fancy and to fancy, thinking what this ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt, and ominous bird of yore meant in croaking nevermore. Never this I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. Well, this and more I sat divining with my head at ease reclining on the cushion's velvet lining that the lamplight gloated o'er. But whose velvet violet lining with a lamplight gloating o'er? She shall press. Oh. Oh. Nevermore. Nevermore. Then methought the air grew denser, perfumed from an unseen censer, swung by seraphim whose footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor. Wretch, I cried, thy God hath lent thee, by these angels he hath sent thee, respite, respite, and nepenthe from thy memories of Lenore. Quaff, oh quaff this kind nepenthe, and forget the lost Lenore. Quote, Quote the, the raven, raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if, if bird or devil, whether tempest sent or whether tempest tossed thee here ashore, desolate, yet all undaunted on this desert land, enchanted on this home by horror haunted, tell me, tell me truly, I implore, is there, is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore. Quote the, the raven, raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, if bird or devil, by that heaven that bends above us, by that God we both adore, tell this soul with sorrow laden, if within a distant Aden it shall clasp a sainted maiden whom the angels name Lenore. Clasp a rare and radiant maiden whom the angels named Lenore. Quote, Quote the raven, nevermore. Be that word our sign of potting, bird or fiend, I shrieked up starting. Get thee back into the tempest and the night's Plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as a token of that lie thy soul hath spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken. Quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart and take thy form from off my door. Quoth, Quoth the, the raven, raven, nevermore. And the raven, never flitting, still is sitting, still, still is, is sitting. sitting, on the pallid bust of Pallas, just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming. <clears throat> and the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor. And my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore. <clears throat> the Raven by Edgar Allan Poe. We have to go. They're coming. Oh, tell you what, you were right about that snack. That really hit the spot. But then again, being with you always makes me work up an appetite. You didn't hear anything, I swear. I just keep feeling like there's somebody watching us. Uh, well, you're just spooked from all the scary stories. Yours and mine. 
But I mean, it's nothing. It's just birds or deer, maybe. I don't know. It's definitely not werewolves or psycho killers. <laughs> You're not as funny as you think you are. And you probably should have avoided that salami if you wanted to kiss. <laughs> <laughs> hey, um, Linda, listen. Uh, there's something I need to talk to you about. About us. Nope, nope. Too serious. And I'm not scared, I'm really not. <laughs> okay. You want another scary story? I've got another one. So buckle your seatbelts. I've got one from the master, Edgar Allan Poe. <laughs> Poe? You think that's scary? I do. No vampires or monsters here. Just blood and guts and a madman overcome by greed. You want to hear something really scary? Watch this. Very dreadfully nervous. I have been and am. But why will you say that I am mad? The disease has sharpened my senses, not destroyed, not dulled them. Above all, was the sense of hearing acute. I heard everything in heaven and on the earth. I heard many things in hell. How then am I mad? Hearken! and observe with what, how healthily and how calmly I can tell you the whole story. It's impossible to say how the idea first entered my brain, but once conceived, I, I haunted me day and night. An object I had not, a passion I had none. I loved the old man. He had never wronged me. He had never given me insult. For his gold, I had no desire. <coughs> so, this is the point. You fancy me mad. Madmen know nothing. But if you could have seen me, if you could have seen how cunningly I proceeded with what caution, with what foresight, with what dissimulation I went about my work. <laughs> I was never kinder to the old man than the whole week. <laughs> Before I killed him. <laughs> Thank you. you. You're so good to me. Uh, well, uh, that's what you pay me for. Well, would you mind fetching the newspaper? It's over on the chair. Of course. Oh, you're, you're so kind. Thank you, my dear boy. Every night, at about midnight, I turned the latch of the bedroom door and opened it. And then, when I had made an opening sufficient for my head, I put in a dark lantern, closed, closed, for, so that no light shone out. <laughs> then, I thrust in my head. Oh, you would have laughed to have seen, seen how I thrust my head in. <laughs> I moved in steadily, steadily, so that I would not disturb the old man's sleep. It took me a whole hour till I got my whole head in so I could see the old man's face as he lay in bed. This I did for seven long nights. Every night at midnight, but every night the old man's vulture eye remained closed. And that was what I needed. That is why I was unable to do the work, because it was not the 
old man who vexed me. It was his evil eye. Every morning, just at dawn, I boldly strode into the chamber, spoke to the old man courageously, calling him by name in a haughty tone, and asked him how he, how he had spent the night. Did you sleep well? Yes, of course. The sheets are a bit stiff, though. Uh, well, we'll have to take care of that then, won't we? <laughs> So you see, he would have had to have been a very profound old man to have suspected that every night I looked in upon him while he slept. Upon the eighth night, the old man's room was black as pitch, with thick darkness. For the shutters were closed fastened for fear of robbers. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he could not see the door opening. <laughs> I put my head in, and I was about to open the lantern, when suddenly, suddenly, the, the, my thumb fell upon the tin fastening, and the old man sprang up in bed and cried out, Who's there? I stood completely still and said nothing. For a whole hour I did not move a muscle. And in the meantime, I did not hear the old man lie down. No, he was sitting up in bed, listening, just as I had done so many times before, to the death watches on the wall. Now, I say, there came into my ear a sound, a low, dull, quick sound, much like a watch makes when, when it's enveloped in cotton. Oh, I knew that sound very well. It was the beating of the old man's heart. It increased my fury, much like the beating of a drum stimulates the soldier into, into battle. Yet for some minutes, I refrained and stood still. But the beating increased. I thought that the heart must burst. And then, a new anxiety seized me. The sound, the sound would be heard by a neighbor. Oh, oh, the old man's hour had come. Uh, with a loud yell, I opened the lantern and burst into the room. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> the night waned, and I moved hastily, but silently. First, I dismembered the corpse. <laughs> uh, first, I cut off the head, and then uh, the arms, oh, and the hands. <laughs> <laughs> and the legs. <laughs> oh, and the feet. <laughs> And then, then I put the pieces of the old man oh, into the closet <laughs> where no human eye, not even his, could have determined, could have suspected anything wrong. Good evening, sir. Uh, evening. Why, I believe it is rather close to morning, officer. Oh, yes. Yes, of course. Uh, we apologize for coming <coughs> in at such an early hour, but we received a call about a shriek. One of your neighbors believed it came from your home. 
Uh, Shriek? Yes, sir. Oh, why, the Shriek was my own. <coughs> oh, a terrible dream, I'm afraid. I have not been back to sleep since. That is why I am up at such an hour. Oh, but, but do come in, officers, and, and have a look around if you want to be sure. <coughs> so you see, the old man is not at home. It is just me alone tonight. And where is he gone? Uh, he has uh, taken some time in the, uh, away in the city, in, in the country, yes. Uh, oh, but uh, please, officers, uh, do sit down. You must be, uh, you must be fatigued at such an hour. Uh, I'll get you some chairs. Very kind of you, sir. So, do uh, you get many calls like this so late at night? Uh, well, false alarms? Well, yes, quite often, uh, especially in a quiet neighborhood like this one. Uh, people do look after their neighbors. Most of them just turn out to be nervous old ladies. <laughs> they sat, and, and I answered cheerily, and then they chatted on familiar things. But ere long, I felt myself getting pale and wished them gone. My head ached, and I can't see the ringing in my ears, and uh, still the officers sat and, and still chatted. Then the sound began again, and it increased. It was a dull, oh, dull, quick sound, it's like much such a, a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. Oh, I gasped for breath, but the officers heard not. Why would they not be gone? I strode across the room, back and forth in heavy strides, and inflamed the fury by the observations of the officers. But still, still, still the sound increased. Oh, God, oh, what could I do? I foamed, I raved, I swore. Still, the sound enveloped all. It grew louder and louder. And still the officers sat and chatted and smiled pleasantly. Could it be that they did not hear it? Oh, mighty God, no, no, no. They heard. They suspected. They knew. They, they were making a mockery of my horror. This I thought, and this I think. But anything, anything will be better than this, this, this agony. Anything more tolerable than this, this derision. Too tired of the, the hypocritical smiles. I felt that I must scream or die. And still, oh, I the sound it grew louder, 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 louder.
Yeesh. Crazy. Table for one. Crazy. Table for one. Can't you hear it, Peter? The beating of the severed heart. Calling out for vengeance. Calling out for you. You know, for as pretty as you are, you certainly have a mean streak to you. You can't distract me by calling me pretty. <laughs> so what do you think? Was the caretaker mad, or did the old man drive him crazy from beyond the grave? Um, you know, I don't know, but, uh, listen, it's getting awfully cold out here, and, <clears throat> Linda, there's something I, I really need to talk to you about. You know, it is getting cold. That sort of freaky on its own. Ooh, listen to this. The Cremation of Sam McGee by Robert W. Service. Linda, just stop. There are strange things done in the midnight sun by the men who moil for gold. The Arctic trails have their secret tales that would make your blood run cold. The northern lights have seen queer sights, but the queerest they ever did see was the night on the marge of Lake Labarge I cremated <coughs> Sam McGee. Now Sam McGee was from Tennessee, where the cotton blooms and blows. Why he left his home in the south to roam round the pole, God only knows. He was always cold, but the land of gold seemed to hold him like a spell. And he'd often say in his homely way, he'd sort of live in hell. On a Christmas day, we were mushing our way over the Dawson Trail. Talk of your cold. Through the parka's fold, it stabbed like a driven nail. If our eyes would close, then the lashes froze, till sometimes we couldn't see. It wasn't much fun, but the only one to whimper was Sam McGee. And that very night, as we lay packed tight in our robes beneath the snow, and the dogs were fed, and the stars o'erhead were dancing heel and toe, he turned to me and, Cap, says he, I'll cash in this trip, I guess. And if I do, I'm asking that you won't refuse my last request. Well, he seemed so low that I couldn't say no. Then he said with a sort of moan, Oh, it's this cursed cold, and it's got right hold till I'm chilled clean through to the bone. Yet, taint being dead, it's my awful dread of the icy grave that pains. So I want you to swear that foul or fair, you'll cremate my last remains. Now a pal's last need is a thing to heed, so I swore I would not fail. We started off at the streak of dawn. My God, he looked ghastly pale. He crouched on the sleigh and he raved all day on his home in Tennessee. Before nightfall, a corpse was all that was left of Sam McGee. There wasn't a breath in that land of death, and I hurried, horror-driven, with a corpse half hid that I couldn't get rid because of a promise given. It was lashed to the sleigh, and it seemed to say, you may tax your brain, brawn and your brains, but you promise true, and it's up to you to cremate those last remains. Now a promise made is a dead unpaid, the trail has its own stern code. In the days to come, though my lips were dumb, in my heart, how I cursed that load. In the long, long night, by the lone firelight, while the huskies round in a ring, howled out their woes to the homeless snows. Oh, God, how I loathe that thing. And every day, that Quiet clay seemed to heavy and heavier grow. And on I went, till the dogs were spent, and the grub was getting low. The trail was bad, and I was half mad, but I swore I would not give in. And I'd often sing to the hateful thing, <laughs> and he hearkened with a grin. <laughs> till I came to the marge of Lake Labarge, and a derelict there lay. It was jammed in the ice, but I saw in a trice it was called the Alice May. I looked at it, and I thought of it, 
and I looked at my frozen chum. Then, here, said I, with a sudden cry, is my crematorium. <laughs> Some planks I tore from the cabin floor, and I lit the boiler fire. Some coal I found that was lying around, and I heaped the fuel higher. The flames just soared, and the furnace roared. That's such a blaze you seldom see. And I burrowed a hole in the glowing coal, and I stuffed in Sam McGee. <laughs> then I took a hike, for I didn't like to hear him sizzle so. <laughs> and the heavens scowled, and the huskies howled, and the wind began to blow. It was icy cold, but the hot sweat rolled down my cheeks, and I don't know why. And the greasy smoke in an inky cloak went streaking down the sky. I do not know how long in the snow I wrestled with grisly fear, but the stars came out, and they danced about, ere again I ventured near. I was sick with dread, but I bravely said, I'll just take a peek inside. I guess he's cooked, and it's time I looked. Then the doors I opened wide. And there sat Sam, looking cool and calm in the heart of the furnace roar. And he wore a smile you could see a mile. And he said, please close that door. <laughs> it's fine in here, but I greatly fear You'll let in the cold in the storm. Since I left Plum Tree down in Tennessee, it's the first time I've been warm. <laughs> there are strange things done in the midnight sun by the men who moil for gold. The Arctic trails have their secret tales that would make your blood run cold. Oh, the Northern Lights have seen queer sights, but the queerest they ever did see was that night on the marge of Lake LaBarge. I cremated Sam McGee. I'm sorry, Peter. I must have uh, drifted off there for a second. But were you saying you were cold? I'm actually feeling quite warm. Do you need me to warm you up? Yes. <clears throat> In a minute. Uh, listen, Linda, there's something you really need to know. Peter, do you like me? You know I do. Then tell me a story. One more spooky story before we have to go home. Okay. All right. Um, one more. Oh, do you know Arthur Conan Doyle? Elementary, my dear Watson. <laughs> exactly. But, you know, he had some more monstrous tales in his bag of tricks, too, like, um, like Rock 249, <laughs> where a group of university students meet an opponent from a very different age. All right, gentlemen, let's get this case up for midnight, shall we? Now, I want to make sure this is able to be seen out front, all right? So, make sure we don't break anything, shall we? Careful. Uh, watch that bag there. I, I cleaned that up. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Uh, just a bit more. Ah. Yes. Thank you for the assistance, gentlemen. Uh, some tea, maybe? Well, maybe perhaps later. But then again, I suppose I'm not as interesting as my friend here. Thanks for helping us, Smith. I'm glad the two of you had a chance to meet. I'm the Grammy Smith, meet Edward Bellingham, engaged to my sister, and soon to be the member of the family. Smith has a room next door. I mean that he studies entirely too much. He's almost always there. Always ready to help a friend. Though you might have mentioned it was a boxed up corpse when you asked for my help carrying it. Well, come on, Bellingham, don't be coy. Hmm? Let's have a look. Ah, yes. <sighs> <sighs> yes. Now, that lady in the box was packed up in the days of the 11th dynasty, some uh, 40 centuries ago. And yet, 
If she could bind her tongue, she'd be able to tell us that this lapse in time was merely a closing of the eyes and a reopening of them. She is a singularly fine mummy. Huh? What is that? What? What? And why did you put it away so quickly? <laughs> Hiding notes from a lover in a mummy's crypt? I might have known you, old dog. No, Papyrus, it's nothing. It has some unique <laughs> properties. I, uh, never mind that. It doesn't concern you. The translation has been slow going, but it has had its rewards. You've been able to translate? Yes. I well, very impressive, old chap. So who is she? I don't know her name. You see, the outer sarcophagus with the inscriptions is missing. Now, she might have been a princess, ooh, or maybe even a priestess, oh, or maybe even a mistress of the ancient mystery. Lot 249 is all the tiles she has now. You see the label on the case here? That was the number at the auction at which I picked her up. I might have imagined you had attraction to older women. <laughs> I'll tell my sister to keep a tighter rein on you. <laughs> Very droll. <laughs> Lot 249 was actually quite a find. Now, she might have seen better days, but it's difficult to find a mummy so intact, so, well, muscles, so, alive. <laughs> oh, look at her. Even in death, there's something so majestic about her. She must have been quite a beauty, a woman like that. Why, she must have overseen the construction of the pyramids. Four millennia later, and she found me waiting for her. It's fate. <laughs> and yet you needed my help to get her up the stairs. Seriously, you want to keep it in your rooms? I have an in-depth study to do. Then again, I could always use the company. It'll be unnerving enough for me if I'm only next door. Besides, I have my own work to do and you're all right now. I but I think for your nervous system, you should take up some less morbid study. Oh, I am not nervous as a rule, and I have unwrapped mummies before. And my new friend and I have a lot of work to do. <laughs> I wasn't sure how seriously I should have taken these words, but well, two days later, my friend Norton was attacked as he was turning out of the high street within a hundred yards of the gate. Now Norton swears that the thing was not human, and indeed from the scratches on his throat I should be inclined to agree with him. Now Norton passes that way every night, around the same hour, and there's a tree that hangs low over the path, the big elm from the garden. Well, anyhow, Norton thinks that the thing dropped on him from out of the tree. He was nearly strangled by two arms which he says were as strong and as thin as steel bands. And he saw nothing, only those beastly arms that tightened and tightened on him. And he yelled his head nearly off. A couple of chaps came running, and the thing went over the wall like a cat. Now, I don't believe in spooks, but perhaps I should have. I know! Why, the fool police even questioned me about it! Yes, Norton and I weren't exactly <coughs> friends, but look at me! I am a slight young man! I I'm a student consumed in books. How could I have taken that fool's body and throttled it? Now, if it had been me, and if I were, well, strong enough, I'd have kept strangling him. Maybe I will next time. The police didn't particularly like that answer. <laughs> but my friend Lee swears that Bellingham was with him when the assault occurred. But then he and Lee had something of a falling out. <laughs> oh, you fool! You'll be sorry. Very likely. 
Mind what I say! It's up! I want to hear of it! <sighs> you promised me, anyhow. I'm not particularly kind to those who take what belongs to me. I'll remain silent, but my silence buys her freedom. I rather even was in a grave to be married to you. Once and for all, she'll do what I say, and we don't want to see you again! argument from my room next door. Now, I should have followed Lee and found out what happened. I mean, Lee was my friend. But I could hear Bellingham speaking his chants again. I could smell the incense burning, and my ear was up against the wall when I could hear a second pair of footsteps coming from the rooms next door. A tragedy in the family, I assure you. Our dear friend Lee was merely standing by the riverbank when he fell in and drowned. <laughs> Somebody threw him in. Okay, picked him up, picked him up like a feather, and hurled him in. Now I heard those heavy steps leave, and then I heard a single scream. And then those footsteps return, not Bellingham's nimble light steps, but heavy thuds, like death. Oh, my dearest Ava's bereft! <clears throat> but I'm sure she'll recover. Bellingham! Oh, uh, would you come in? Show me the corpse, Bellingham. Prove to me you don't have Lee's blood on your hands. Are you mad? Get out! Do you assert that had anything to do with Lee's accident? Hmm? Hmm? Uh, um. uh. Open the sarcophagus. Uh. Uh. Certainly. It's empty? Hmm? Where's the creature? Uh, uh. Oh! <laughs> yes. Kill him. Make it stop, or the mummy won't be the only corpse in the room. And now what? And now, the roll of papyrus that you had on the table that night. I believe it's in your suit pocket. Hand it over to me. Okay, fine, sure. Although, you know, maybe we're meant to be partners. You don't know the power in that scroll, but I do, and I can share. It is unique. It has wisdom in it that is nowhere else to be found. It also contains unique properties that allow our friend here to... What? Huh? No. No! Do you have any idea what you're doing, you fool? Your filthy tricks won't answer in England. You see, we've given up burning folk like you, but we still keep a hangman. You're going to leave the college tonight. Oh. Any man that meets his death while I'm still here, and I'll see you swing for it. And not 249! Well, perhaps it was just you know, the papyrus and your hatred that moved her. But as you're packing, I believe we'll set up a small bonfire for your bag of bones here. Get her back in the box. And if you return to your old tricks, you'll hear from me again. Now, good morning, for I must return to my studies.
that's not so bad. The mummy destroyed and the villain thwarted. The best kind of scares are the ones with the happy ending. Uh-huh. Listen, Linda, there's something I really need to talk to you about. Like, you see... It's right yeah. over here! <laughs> I've been hearing noises all night! I saw lights! Right over there! <laughs> it's those Sheriff, kids again! Sheriff's office, come on out! I, I'm sorry, officer. We didn't mean to trespass. Did you see anything? Well, not now, but, but I heard noises. <sighs> Officer, I'm over here. Officer. Another false alarm! You have us come out here every week! <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm hearing things! Yeah, you hear things? What do you hear? Well, it's noises, noises and stuff. <sighs> Officer, this isn't funny. I'm right here. Oh, more mysterious lights! Oh! <laughs> 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 Torn his after they found that couple. <sighs> Just as right. Oh, shut up, Dave. <laughs> no, Peter, what's happening? If you come out here quicker, you just miss him. You need to put this place on your patrol route. Then I feel much uh, safer. Let's go back to his car. Oh, help me. Yeah, right. Help me, I'm right here. From ghoulies and ghosties and long legged beasties and things that go bump in the night. Oh, good Lord. Deliver us. And you? Keep quiet out there, whatever you are. <laughs> no, I'm not dead. I'm not dead. I'm sorry, Linda. I tried to tell you. But what happened? How long? Does it matter? Is the answer going to make you feel any better? I... I guess not. Maybe it was a vampire that got you. <laughs> or a creature returned from the grave. Or a caretaker's greed. Driven mad by Eldridge forces. But you're one of us now. A tale to frighten others. So there's no reason for you to be afraid anymore. <laughs> but what do we do now? Gather around, everyone. So, do you want to hear a scary story? <laughs> <laughs>